In this video, we're going to go through a topic that many students and junior doctors find very confusing, which is the control of eye movements. It's an integral part of understanding eye movement disorders like nystagmus and understanding common presentations like vertigo. There are three main systems that control eye movements. Voluntary eye movement refers to the intentional shifting of your gaze. The vestibular ocular reflex adjusts your eye movement to remain fixed on a static object whilst your head is moving, and the cerebellum fine-tunes these eye movements to make sure that they're smooth. Let's have a quick recap of the muscles and nerves involved in eye movement. There are six main muscles that work together to allow our eyes to move in various directions. These muscles are innervated by three different cranial nerves. The abducens innervates the lateral rectus, the trochlear nerve innervates the superior oblique, and the oculomotor nerve innervates the others. To keep things simple, we'll primarily be focusing on horizontal gaze, and hence the abducens and oculomotor nerves. It's important to remember nonetheless that the same principles apply to eye movements in the vertical plane. Let's begin with the voluntary control of eye movements. So here's a broad overview of the areas of the central nervous system that are involved in the control of eye movements. The frontal eye fields within the cortex are responsible for initiating voluntary eye movements. The brainstem is where the oculomotor, trochlear and abducens nuclei are found. And the cerebellum, as I mentioned earlier, is important for fine tuning. There are a few key points to remember regarding the voluntary control of eye movements. First of all, the left frontal eye fields controls right horizontal gaze and vice versa. The cranial nerves do not cross and hence a control center of some form is needed to ensure that the nerves to both eyes work together to shift gaze accordingly. So here we can see that to shift gaze towards the right, we need the left medial rectus and the right lateral rectus to contract simultaneously. Let's look at this in a bit more detail. So let's imagine that you're looking straight at this patient in front of you. Um, so pay attention to the laterality. So right is on the left, left is on the right, as if they're just facing you. To actively shift our gaze to the right, a command is initiated from the left frontal eye fields. This projects down to a control center known as the paramedian pontine reticular formation within the contralateral pons. From here, there are projections going to the abducens nucleus, from which the abducens nerve emerges and innervates the lateral rectus on the right side. From the abducens nucleus, there's an interneuron that projects to the oculomotor nucleus via a pathway called the medial longitudinal fasciculus, or MLF. The oculomotor nerve innervates the left medial rectus, causing adduction of the left eye. This is the system that controls voluntary horizontal gaze, and there are similar pathways that coordinate vertical gaze. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia is an important condition that comes up fairly often in exams, and it's a disease that affects the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and it often occurs in the context of demyelinating conditions like multiple sclerosis. The defect means that the oculomotor and abducens nerves are no longer working in unison. In the case of INO, affecting the left MLF, the patient will be able to look to the left without any issue. However, when they look to the right, their left eye is no longer able to adduct. This is because there is no longer a connection between the right abducens nucleus and the left oculomotor nucleus. You will also likely see some beats of nystagmus in the right eye. In this part, we're going to talk about the vestibular ocular reflex. The purpose of this reflex, as I mentioned earlier, is to enable you to fix your gaze on an object in space whilst your head is in motion. This is the apparatus that allows you to keep focused on an object whilst you're walking, for example. So this is the vestibular apparatus. It's a snail-shaped structure that's located within the inner ear and it enables us to sense the movement of our head in space. We don't need to go into the structure and function of the vestibular apparatus in too much detail in this video, but it's worth knowing that there are three main parts, the semicircular canals, the utricle, and the saccule, which detect rotational, horizontal, and vertical movements respectively. So let's focus on horizontal rotational movement. And so imagine that you're looking at this patient from the top down, so you're basically staring at the crown of their head. And I've just put the eyes there as well for, for you to make, uh, make sense of how they correlate. So initially, when the head is still, the vestibular apparatus on both sides will be releasing a baseline signal to the brain. 
The brain interprets the balance of signals from the two sets of vestibular apparatus to determine the direction in which the head is moving. When the head rotates to the left, the semicircular canals on the left will be activated and those on the right will be inhibited. The two signals are fed back to the brainstem and a vestibular ocular reflex is initiated to maintain focus on the object. Let's look more closely at the pathway involved. The activation of the horizontal semicircular canals on the left will increase firing via the vestibular cochlear nerve. This goes to the vestibular nuclei in the pons. From here, an interneuron will travel to the contralateral abducens nucleus, thereby causing contraction of the contralateral lateral rectus. To ensure that the ipsilateral eye adducts appropriately, an interneuron will travel from the contralateral abducens nucleus to the ipsilateral oculomotor nucleus via the ascending MLF. The oculomotor nerve can trigger contraction of the ipsilateral medial rectus, resulting in adduction. It's worth noting at this point that there are both activating and inhibitory processes. The same way that the activating signal travels via the pathway just discussed, resulting in contraction of the muscles required to bring about the desired eye movement, the inhibitory signal from the right semicircular canals will deactivate the opposing muscles, in this case, the right medial rectus and the left lateral rectus. And finally, it's important to consider the role of the cerebellum. As with any voluntary movements in any other part of the body, the cerebellum plays an important role in fine-tuning eye movements. This is why cerebellar diseases can manifest with disorders of eye movements such as nystagmus. If we go back to the slide regarding the different systems involved in the control of eye movement, we can think about the various possible causes. If we think about the voluntary pathway, a stroke affecting the frontal eye fields or demyelination of some of the important pathways such as the MLF, can cause disorders of eye movements. Similarly, strokes, demyelination and alcohol excess can affect cerebellar function, resulting in disorders of eye movements as well. Finally, abnormalities in the functioning of the vestibular apparatus, as seen in BPPV, vestibular neuritis and Meniere's disease, will also disrupt eye movements because it tricks the brain into thinking that the head is in motion when it is actually still. When referring to vertigo, any causes related to vestibular disease are considered the peripheral causes of vertigo. On the other hand, central causes are those that relate to the brain and brainstem. If you like our content, please do like and subscribe, and please do feel free to suggest any other topics that you'd like us to cover in the future. Thank you for listening.